Tonight, our moderator is Jason Wong. He's no stranger to all of us. He's the chairman of the board of focus on the family. He's also advisor to Gatekeeper Singapore. And Jason was a senior government official in the ministry before and is known for some of the projects that he helped to start, like Yellow Ribbon, and that's for life. Jason needs not a little and introduction because he's very familiar face among believers in the body of Christ in Singapore. So now without much ado, I will, I will welcome Jason Wong uh, to moderate this session and introduce the rest of the panelists to all of us. Over to you, Jason. Thank you, Brother Georgie. Hello, everyone. I am uh, Jason. Happy to be your moderator tonight as well as uh, to be one of the panelists and to speak uh, to all of you. Let me just cover some uh, research findings because uh, during the COVID period, the last two, three months, um, we actually have uh, two surveys that were done. Uh, I'm going to share that with you, but uh, for a start, I, I mean, this is not unfamiliar because uh, three, four months ago when the first country first went on the lockdown, China, for example, uh, they were expecting maybe a baby boom, more babies, but instead they, they, they had a divorce explosion yeah, because uh, people are more tense being locked down and, and having to stay home, uh, looking at each other. But what about Singapore? In fact, uh, this was in May. Uh, it was discovered that in the month of April to early part of May, there were more family violence cases uh, during the circuit breaker. Police had to respond to some of these uh, call for help. And just today, I just saw today's papers and it was reported that uh, MSF, Ministry of Social and Family Development, experienced a 30% increase in queries, not so much of family violence only, but uh, about family marital conflicts. Uh, this was in phase two after the circuit breaker was lifted. And, uh, and of course, uh, last two months, we had uh, the Mother's Day period, the Father's Day period, right, in May and in June. So focus on the family, also did some surveys to just check in on uh, how the moms are faring and the dads are faring. So if you can see, the, the top three challenges for moms face during the COVID-19, the first is family's health and safety. I think moms are more concerned about the, the health of our children, you know, whether they catch the virus or not. And of course, the managing kids during the stay-home period. Now, that was the peak of the stay-home, right? Uh, uh, where, where there is a need for, for the, the children to study at home and uh, homeschooling. And of course, third, for those moms who are also working, uh, managing work and home responsibilities. So these are the challenges faced by moms. And during the Father's Day period, another survey was done for dads. And well, these are the top three uh, struggles that dads face. And of course, the first is uh, coping with work and family. You know, uh, fathers, most of fathers are working. So the work and family uh, balancing and uh, and then financial pressures, especially with what is happening. Uh, the economic situation is uh, not so good. I think there are concerns about finance and, of course, uh, managing children's behavior and problems. I think there is some, even post-COVID or during COVID or pre-COVID, uh, I think this is one of the challenges faced by most of us uh, who are dads or moms. Now, one of the things we also discovered that six out of 10 fathers experience that guilt. Now, what does it mean, that guilt? Basically meaning that we feel guilty. Guilty about what? And then here, guilty about not spending enough time with our, our family, not spending enough time with our children. And of course, the source of the guilt, as you can see here, they don't spend enough time with children because of work. Yeah, because of work. But they want to spend more time, just that uh, they do not have enough time. But the good thing is that uh, during the COVID, during the circuit breaker, 73% uh, of the dads, I think also some of the moms, uh, indicated that they have increased involvement because now everybody stays at home, right? And, uh, and then 85% of these who feel that they have an increased involvement felt that they are now more connected with the children. So it's a blessing in these guys, even though COVID is not a good thing, but at the same time, it has brought forth some positive outcomes. And another survey conducted locally was by Salt and Light. And in fact, this survey covers Christians, right? The focus on the family covered Christians as well as non-believers, but Salt and Light covered Christians. They didn't uh, uh, find out about family relationships in particular, but they touch on uh, the individual emotional health, the emotional state. So you can see by the different age groups from uh, below 17, means the younger ones, 18 to 25 years old, now you go down up to the 65 and above. Now you realize that the younger ones are feeling more stressed. Uh, 
right? Uh, the green and the dark blue is about my emotional state is now more worse or much worse or slightly worse. So you can see slightly worse or much worse. The younger ones are facing the stress the, the, because of the COVID situation. And uh, the older ones are less likely to face some of this stress. Uh, then to the question, how has your walk with God been affected? Now, again, the younger ones find that their relationship with God, their walk with God has been uh, worse or slightly worse or much worse. And the older one seems to have uh, uh, time to spend with, with God. So in a family situation, if uh, you are an adult and uh, if your relationship with God is affected and you are feeling more stress and your children are also feeling more stress, I think that's where you, know, you, you will have a lot of tension. Uh, interestingly, from this uh, survey find, findings by Sorts and Light, it is discovered that the closer a person is with God, the less stress they will feel at home. Yeah. So I think this is an interesting uh, uh, finding, uh, which I, for, I think for most of us, it will not be unfamiliar, right? I mean, if we have God in our relationships, if we have God uh, with us, then uh, more likely our relationships with everyone else will be better. So with that as the background, I would like now to uh, introduce to you our first uh, speaker who is uh, Mr. Benny Bong. Now, I know Benny uh, many years ago when I was working in the prisons, and after that, I went over to Ministry of Social and Family Development. A wonderful brother, recently we did a webinar together as well. Now, let me just say a few words about him before he takes over. He's a trained family and marital therapist, and uh, he's the director and principal consultant of the family therapist. Uh, he is currently the president of the society, Against Family Violence, of which he was one of his founding members more than 30 years ago. He has over 35 years of experience in counselling individuals, couples and families. Also engaged in training and mentoring of professionals. Now, he regularly teaches modules at the degree and postgraduate levels at the NIE as well as the Singapore Bible College. So he has a wealth of experience and he's going to be our first uh, speaker. So now let me hand the time over to Benny. Over to you. Okay, good evening everybody. Um, and welcome to this uh, webinar on looking at the influencing families within a time of post-COVID crisis. Um, uh, first of all, I want to say something about my uh, relationship with um, Jason. So uh, he, he said we had this two, uh, two, not one webinars, two webinars, you know, and, and I had a great experience with him. Uh, we were looking at a film, uh, Call Me Dad, and I would really recommend, encourage you to watch that film if you haven't. Uh, and um, so when he said, you know, would you like to do another webinar? And, and, and um, I guess I was taken in by the enthusiasm of the period. I said, yes, you know, and uh, what's the topic? And he shared with me the topic, you know, and I, I, I should go to the share screen to show you what was the topic that he came up with. Ah, so shaping families in the post-COVID world, you know, um, and, and, and after saying yes, I was thinking to myself, what in the world did I say yes to? Uh, because um, we are still in the midst of the pandemic. We, we haven't yet seen the end of it yet, you know, and, and uh, you know, it, it's, it's a bit presumptuous to talk about trying to shape the families. And, and, and when I shared with Jason this view, he said, well, you know, uh, we're talking about shaping, you know, we're not talking about, uh, you know, why wait until the end? Why wait until the end of the pandemic before we begin the work? And I, and I thought, you know, that made sense. And so, you know, here, here am I uh, with this topic. Um, so let me just share with you some quick thoughts I had with regards to this. Well, ever since the arrival of uh, this novel coronavirus, um, it's, and it's just over six months ago, um, it has shaken our world in every sense of the word, in every domain. Um, how our children study, how we do our work, how we bis do business across the seas, how we relate to other people in different countries, our supply chains have been affected. Um, we are also feeling the effect on how we entertain ourselves. 
movies are no longer available, travel is out. Uh, it also affects the way we interact with our families. And so there was a whole long period of um, circuit breaker measures that were in place. And also it impacts the way we worship our God. Uh, so church services have been curtailed and uh, are only slowly coming back. And again, we, we are warned that this is, this is all tentative. Uh, if there's a second wave, if there's a spike, things may go back to normal. And we don't know what is the end, uh, when it will appear, what will happen. Yeah? Uh, and it's, it's not too long ago that WHO announced to the world that there's a public health emergency of an international concern. Uh, it took them a little while before they used the word pandemic. And of course, now this has become what all of us are experiencing. So almost every corner of human experience has been touched. And, and this evening, we're going to talk and think a little bit about the family because it's also one area that has been touched. And it's as if a rocket has taken off. And if we, if we can't stop this rocket from taking off, can we at least try to influence its trajectory? Uh, which direction it goes. It can be at least try to mitigate some of its, effect, its effects. And, and, and so this evening, I'd like to just say a little bit about how we can mitigate the effects. But first and foremost, I'd like us to be very clear that COVID-19 is a crisis. Yeah? A crisis. And, and, and I, 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 I've been introduced as a family and marital therapist. I, I, I train as a social worker. My background uh, one of the, the subjects I studied was sociology. And, and, and we were trained and we were told that a crisis is an event that overwhelms our usual coping, our usual way of getting on with life, our usual way of attaining success, stability. All that is being put under scrutiny. You know? And the wonderful thing about a crisis, wonderful, is that it prompts change. And it's to say that the outcome of a crisis can either be good or can be bad. It can be for better or it can be for worse. So it's a point of opportunity, a crisis. And to be clear, COVID-19 is not just one crisis. It's multiple. It's at many layers. Yeah, as I said, it impacts employment, not just lives, but livelihood. It impacts our future. And it's multiple because it seems to be evolving even as we go. Uh, this, this virus is, has been described in many ways. One of it is to say that it's a very tricky virus. It's coming up with something new every time. Uh, we're discovering more and more stuff. Yeah, we, we hope we don't, but we're discovering more and more stuff about this virus. It's also chronic in nature, meaning that although we are in a crisis now, which disrupts everything. This crisis is not going to go away in a week, in a month. We're not even sure if in a year. Uh, last week, we had another webinar uh, at NUS where they talked about, uh, they had some of the best experts in the field uh, coming to Singapore and talking through webinar about this. And even with the discovery of a vaccine, it will still take some time more. So we have a crisis. It's multiple. It's like a boxer being taking hit after hit after hit. Uh, and it's chronic, meaning that with each hit, you know, some of our resources, some of our, our resolve is going to be depleted. So if COVID-19 is a crisis, then what do we know about the effect? And especially, I think, uh, Jason has done a great job to tell us its impact on the family because that's what we are here this evening to think about. Well, there's increase in conflicts, there's breakdown, uh, not baby boom, but boom in uh, the, the legal industry, the family law, where people are going to talk about divorce. Yeah. As soon as circuit breaker begins to lift, more people are going to say, I've had it. You know, uh, This circuit has not only broken uh, many things, but it's also broken my, my resolve to want to stay in the marriage. Um, it's another effect it has is that it seems to have increased the gap 
between generations. Partly that's been because of social isolation, um, wanting to also protect uh, our elderly folks. Uh, but it also increased the gap in generations because with the social isolation, it is the young who are better equipped, more adept to make good use of uh, other means of communication. Uh, the computer, the, the webinars, Zoom, uh, whatever you have, they, 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 are, they are so adept in it. Whereas for the older generations, uh, we are struggling with it. We, uh, I, I've never thought I had to use as so much Zoom. I, I don't even know whether I'm coming or going. You know, I'm Zooming here and there. You know, and thank, thank goodness that I'm only able to survive in this, this new era because um, uh, my, my daughter's taking shelter in our home and she's much more plugged in to the internet world. So this, this gap is existing. It shows weaknesses also in our social compact. Now I'm using the word social compact a bit more broadly. Social compact is what defines us as a society. What is our sense of cohesiveness? And I guess when we come to this point where we have concerns about the spread of the virus, we begin to be aware of how large segments of our community are kind of in a very disadvantaged position. Uh, people in nursing homes, uh, people who are unable to find space, adequate space in their one-room flats, some of them in their rental facility, and they all have to be grouped together. Uh, simply because there's no other place that they call home. And of course, our guest worker population, where we suddenly begin to be aware that, oh my goodness, you know, this is the state of well-being that they have, and this is the state of living. And it's beginning to show that as a society, there are all of these cracks that exist. It affects our physical, our mental, and our spiritual health. Um, the, the studies of what happened after the um, French, I mean, the, the, the Spanish flu uh, at the turn of the last century, the studies that took place, what happened after post-SARS, indicate that the population takes a longer time to recover, not just to recover from the physical uh, ravages of the virus, but it takes a longer time to recover from the mental, the psychological ravages. There's a sense of, and, and in, in one of uh, Jason's paper about how people begin to question their faith. Where is God in all of this? So it's not just affecting Singapore, but, but also overseas, you know, families overseas. What I'd like to turn us to is, is three coping strategies. And, and we can talk a little bit more in the Q&A. But sociologists tells us that when faced with repeated crisis after crisis, chronic crisis, to the point where we feel like we are perpetually in the state of crisis, three strategies are helpful. The first is synergy. Synergy is about pulling your resources within the family, coming together. It's, it's like the, the American pioneers when they struck out into the Wild West and they were attacked by all these hostiles. They decided, let's circle the wagon. Yeah, they all rode in wagons, and when they circled the wagons, they made the circling of the wagons like a tight fort so that they could each protect themselves. You know, in army, we learn about having overlapping fields of fire so that we can try to draw support from each other. So the first coping strategy is to synergize, to, to send out the bugle call to tell the family, hey, hey folks, let us all come together and deal with this. This is not just father's problem. This is not just mother's problem. This is all of us. Now, to do this, families need to be able to identify themselves as being part of the family. So here's where we see one main problem here. Because when you sound the bugle alarm, it says, come, come, come in and, and rally round. But the members of the family don't feel like, why should I? I'm too busy in my own life, you know. Uh, anyway, why should I? Because you never helped me. And why should I help you now? So this sense of identity is really going to be sorely tested. 
what defines your family? Do you have a sense of loyalty to it? Yeah. And of course, this identity and harmony are two important ingredients to make this synergy work. Yeah. So relationships in the home are going to be solely tested if they're going to use this strategy. The second strategy is interface, which means then that when we tap all of our resources, we pull all of our resources together, we may find that we are still short. We may find that it's not enough. And interface is the family's willingness to now connect with others outside the family, both formal and informal. Formal connections would be maybe the family service centers, the communities, the uh, Ministry of Social and Family Welfare, connecting with all of these people. Yeah? The informal could be the neighbors, the extended family, even the church community. Now, when you tap a wider pool of resources, chances are you're going to reach into deeper wells. Now, however, to be able to do this, families need to overcome their sense of pride. And sometimes we see that, sometimes we feel that, you know, we have been so successful in life, we have never reached out and asked for a helping hand and we find it hard to do that. But, you know, we will have to say to many families, this is a long, long battle. And there's no shame in reaching out and getting help. In fact, it strengthens us as a community when we are able to help others in their difficulty. So we need to overcome pride and recognize our oneness. The last strategy is compromise. So after pulling together resources, reaching out for help, we may find that still the cloth is still not enough to meet all our needs. We may have to acknowledge the long-term challenges and reevaluate some of our priorities. Maybe the plan of sending the kids overseas to study may have to be reviewed. Maybe the plan of upgrading the house, doing a massive renovation, that has to be shelved for a while. Maybe the plan of just how we live on the day to day, you know, the, the kind of choices we make, the decision to live more simply within our means, that's the compromise that may need to have, may need to happen. So from the sociological lens, we know that there are these three useful coping strategies that are available to all families. Yeah. I, I want to share one more thing to you because I know this audience uh, has a strong representation of people who have a common faith. And for this, I want to go to the work, the, the, the book of Jeremiah, chapter 29, 11 to 13. And using this idea of compromise, but this time compromise from a different sense. Yeah? Compromise is to change one's view. Now I'm suggesting we change our lens. How can we apply the lens of God to look at our situation. Uh, and, and a little bit of background, Jeremiah uh, was at a time where the nation of Israel was overcome by the Babylonians. Uh, a good portion of the population uh, was taken up into captivity. What was left behind, the remnants, had to rebuild. Uh, and Jeremiah was a prophet. And he had a statement, a message to those exiles and is a message of encouragement. He says, for I know the plans I, God, have for you. I know the plans. It's not our plans, it's God's plans. Declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. The response from the people was that they should call upon the Lord to come to Him, to pray, to seek, to find Him. The response is to return back to obedience. Uh, God allowed the Babylonians to come in and decimate the population and take into captivity a large chunk of the population, primarily because they disobeyed. Now, I don't know why COVID-19 has happened, but I do know that it is not something outside of God's plans. And it's not our plan, it's God's plans. And the message to us as a population is that, you know, these are His plans and 
Because it's his plans, it is designed for us to prosper, not to destroy us, to give us hope and a future. So as we, as we think about this in light of COVID, in light of the fact that we can't even see the end of this tunnel, how can we still say, I can't see the end, but I know the end. I may not be able to see the end, but I know the end. So folks, uh, do not despair, but keep steady the course. Uh, the Lord has much work for us to do and we have to keep steady in the course, not to be distracted by the wind and the waves. Um, we need to also to clarify our own thinking. I think what COVID-19 has done is to call to question many, many things, many, many things that we have accepted as norms, as important, uh, as you know, pillars in our society. It's, it's called to question these things and it's an opportunity to, to challenge them. You know, which do we put our faith in? Uh, there's a need to also teach the young in the midst of this crisis because here the young are also looking to us as elders, as parents in homes to understand what's going on. Yeah. Where's our faith? And I think it's also an opportunity to help, to help other families to be a demonstration of the love of humanity, of God's love also to reach out to other families in need. And so I'd like to leave you with these thoughts and uh, thank you very much. I look forward to the questions. Wonderful, Benny. Thank you so much. Mm. And I'm sure uh, many of you would have uh, really benefited from what Benny has shared. You know, he's a true counsellor. You know, he talked about coping strategies. So I really love the SIC, Synergy Interface uh, Compromise. Now, so you feel free to ask a question using the Q&A tab. So do not ask questions in the chat box. You can, in the chat box, you can talk about what you have learned, what you find helpful, what you have picked up. But if you have a question, go to the Q&A tab and ask your question yeah, before you forget. Now, uh, as you uh, give your feedback in the chat box or ask your question in the Q&A tab, let me introduce uh, the next set of speakers. It's a mother and daughter pair. Uh, first, let me talk about Carol. Uh, Carol, if you look at the, her CV uh, given in the publicity, she's an international director with Generations of Virtue. She's a John Maxwell um, certified uh, uh, leadership and family coach. She founded a village consultancy and uh, she uh, also conducts a, a worldview course because she's trained at the Cosen Center. Now, I know Carol a number of years ago when I was uh, working uh, in a committee at the Ministry of Education. She was a staff there at the time, a civil servant, but she was so passionate about family. She will find opportunities to champion family, work with the parents. In fact, uh, on her own accord, she will gather parents for prayer uh, sessions, prayer meetings. And in recent years, uh, she left the service and now she's still doing what she loves best. And recently, uh, she's been doing some work with her own daughter, Nico. And Nico is a poly student pursuing film and media studies. And uh, she is a young family champion. I mean, you know, young people now want to fight for animal rights, environmental, <laughs> you know, the tree, save the tree, save the whales. But for her, she is fighting for family because she wants to champion family. And she is also a John Maxwell certified leadership coach herself. And together with her mom, and, uh, uh, Carol, they have been conducting this uh, crash course on uh, worldview and culture. So, Later, I'm sure they're going to talk about it. So let me now hand you over first to Nico. Hi, everybody. Yeah, so yeah, I'm Nico, as you heard from my introduction. Um, thank you for making time today. And I really, really hope that my perspective as a younger person here tonight will be something that adds to this conversation about family. Yeah, so um, I'm passionate about this topic and I only came to realize it after the years in my previous school, very being interestingly drawn to those who were deemed troublemakers and weird. And when I had and continued to have conversations with my friends about my family and I asked about theirs, I always find like this small talk to be a reminder that my family is vastly different compared to many other families. And I'm blessed to have a family who understands where I come from, who can cope with me and one where we really have a safe space to talk about life. Thanks, mom. And so now with COVID-19, like we are all like at home, we are, 
enclosed. We're watching and hearing each other 24-7. And for some families, they find opportunities to have fun and grow closer. And I'm sure you will have seen that from the survey that you were shown just now on the slides. And however, for others, really being with people who can't really understand each other's views and habits, it could cause tension within the family and in more serious cases, arguments, abuse and divorce as mentioned just now. So of course, there isn't really an overnight one-time solution to the clashes and personalities as well as thinking at home. And I feel that it may be more than what we see on the surface. And most of the time, the root cause goes much deeper and much way back. Maybe for, from my perspective as kids, sometimes me and my friends might be talking about things that really affected us from like really long ago, from like 9 or 10 years old, sometimes even younger than that. And so in 2016, I had the opportunity to be part of the Fam Champs camp. And if you're unfamiliar with Fam Champs, it's called Family Champions. And uh, it's a movement started by Focus on the Family, where Jason is from. And we campers, during then, we learned about the different roles of family members, the different family situations that are present in Singapore, and how we as youth can support and cherish our own families. And a while later, after that camp, I also had the opportunity to attend a songwriting workshop. And I ended up walking away from that workshop with a song from my dad, which is pretty cool. And yeah, so I also managed to get some opportunities to perform that song in front of like a few crowds here and there. And so now, currently, I use whatever opportunities that I have to really share about family and being optimistic on social media. And now you're probably thinking, oh, as a young girl, she's on social media. Yeah, you're right, <laughs> on social media. I really believe strongly that media is a powerful tool that we can all use for good. And I personally share content with friends that's really encouraging and uplifting because I'm sure there might be people out there who might have a down day and you never really know if a simple post that you share could uplift their day and make them feel better about themselves. And it's also quite interesting that um, there isn't a school for parents. And I don't know like how I got to think about that, but I did. And so honestly, the only lessons we have most likely are from life experiences. And if you're blessed enough, sometimes even conferences and workshops about family. And then you're probably thinking like, why is an 18 year old girl talking about parenting and family? And so <laughs> I think, um, it's true though, it, this like parenting and family doesn't impact just one generation, but the generation after and the one even after that. And I actually just wanted to point out something that Benny shared just now um, about really using different means of communication, especially now with COVID-19 and we're all going online trying to use different ways to connect with our friends because now we can't see them physically anymore and I'm sure we're all aware of that. So um, I just wanted to share a story about how I communicated with my parents. And this was even before COVID-19. So mom, if you're watching, haha, I love you. Um, <laughs> so um, when I was communicating with my mom and my dad in the past, it was really very different. And I'm sure you understand that like girls and girls, we have a very different way of communicating compared to girls and guys, and namely me and my dad. So um, when I was younger, I was much, much closer to my mom. And um, I hope she's not making any faces at me right now. But when I was younger, I could pour out my heart to her because um, I knew I could trust her. Not that I didn't trust my dad, but I, I felt that I had a safer space with my mom. And so how I used to talk with my mom and communicate with her will always be um, really just spending time to talk to one another and um, she'll hear me out and I'll pour out my heart and uh, we can have that safe interaction and even if it's something that's not very safe for me at least we still have you know that space of conversation um, and then with my dad it was yeah it was really vastly different um, when I was younger I couldn't understand where he was coming from because I just didn't have that awareness of his position as a dad and as a son and as a husband so yeah quite wow whew, so deep so with my dad it was kind of I only talked to him about academics because okay it's true like kids need to do well in school and um, I hope there's no kids watching please do your homework because I didn't um, 
And like with my dad, I found it a little bit harder to connect with him, but only recently because um, I guess I grew more mature and I really got to understand like his place and especially um, as a working adult too and having many different responsibilities to juggle. And because I understand where he was coming from and we got to talk a lot more, he would drive me to and from school and we just have that safe space to um, talk about like stuff. And since he likes sports, I like sports, we talk about sports and bikes and cars and music. So it's just the small things, which is quite interesting to build from that small thing and grow closer. And so now I can share my thoughts more openly with him. He's more open as well, praise the Lord. And so we really now can like be closer and have more conversations that go deeper beyond the surface level. Like, do you do your homework yet? So yeah, and I really just wanted to end off um, hoping that I'm an accurate enough representation of youth who are passionate about family and want to make positive change to any negative family culture that exists out there. And I strongly believe that like one-time chats like this is not enough. So you can connect with me or my mom at our upcoming session about Christian worldview and culture. So if you heard from Jason just now, um, yeah, we do have that session. It's coming up real soon. And we really just want to spend that time together to talk about the foundational values we hold as Christians that really shape our family values and culture. So we're going back to family. And so, yeah, stay tuned for more of that because my mom's going to talk more about it later. Yes. And my final thoughts to leave with you, I'll probably leave another thought with you later. But a final thought, it's never too late to build the bridges that might be broken before and your family members will really appreciate your genuinity and care. So really, it's those small steps and really take those baby steps. And even if it's hard, just trust in God, our Heavenly Father, who cares for you always. Thank you. Amen. Thank you, Nicole. I'm so proud of you. <laughs> okay, I am going to share my slide. Uh, Okay, I have a, a short deck of slides to share with everyone and I have uh, entitled my short sharing Re Raising Resilient Disciples and our mission field starts from our home. So on this deck, uh, this is my family. My most important job is actually wife to one man. My husband is Albert uh, and I have two girls. Nicole is my uh, firstborn, she's 18 and my younger one is 15. Uh, both of them are very interested in media. It's something that we talk about every day. Uh, the good and the bad. Uh, yeah, so thank you so much for having me tonight. I am serving in Generations of Virtue, which is a ministry, and our mission is to transform culture one family at a time. Uh, we look at the cultural issues uh, at this moment, for example, how do we use technology, uh, issues relating to sexuality, and how do we talk about that first in the home. So that's what the ministry is about. Uh, COVID-19 actually has brought new opportunities to us. Uh, in the past, before COVID-19, we used to, uh, you know, just wait for churches to invite us, you know. Uh, but now, actually, with, with the current situation, it has allowed us to move online to reach more people. So we started to run speaker series uh, starting from May. And almost every week, we brought in different people from different parts of the world. Recently, we had a conversation with Sean McDowell and uh, Christopher Yuan. And uh, I will share with you a little bit more about what we have uh, for this month. Uh, and we have plans to do for the rest of the year. Uh, and so actually this, this season has been very exciting uh, for the ministry. Uh, in the marketplace, I run a social enterprise. It's called Village Consultancy. It's a word that God gave me. I, I was not very creative. He just said village. Oh, just take a, it takes a village to raise a child. And so that's what I've been doing uh, uh, in the marketplace. Uh, I... I create opportunities for generations to come together to talk about uh, media. How do you manage media in the home, for example? It is a, 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 an issue that I find many families need to grapple with. And so I find opportunities to do that. I work with tech companies, I work with schools, I talk to educators uh, across generations. And, and really, it's always my joy to bring uh, 
parents together, you know, it really takes a village to raise a child. When we come together, we realize that the issues or the challenges that we face is not just born by us alone, that there are other people also facing the same thing. And sometimes when we talk to one another, that's where we can encourage one another. We find solutions that we ourselves may not be able to think of. So um, I'm very thankful to be able to serve uh, in, in these two ways. I wanted to just share a little bit of reflection on this season and how this has impacted my family. Uh, this, this whole season really has reminded me that family is the basic unit of society. You know, before this season, I know it as a concept, right? I know that when a family is strong, the nation is strong. But in this season, it's really, it's really an experiential learning. So what, what do I mean by that? You know, when, when it comes to the circuit breaker, everything happens in the family unit. We cannot even go and see my sister who is staying uh, uh, elsewhere from us. I cannot even see uh, other relatives, right? Everything happens within the family. And family is actually, the, your home is actually the only place that we don't need to wear masks. You know, every time when I come back, either from grocery shopping or I come back from appointment, I'm so happy to be home because I can take off my mask. And it's almost symbolic. The home is the place that we don't need to wear masks, that we can be transparent with one another. The home is the place that we should feel safe and it's a refuge. And that's what God intends for us to be. The first picture that you see for us all holding McDonald's, <laughs> we were just so happy. You know, you know, we are a very simple family, right? McDonald's make us happy. So, but then when, there was a season in Singapore when all the McDonald's stores were closed. You know, even drive-ins were closed. And so, after that season when they were closed and they were opened, we were so happy. We just drove out again and we took this picture. Yay! You know, we had McDonald's. That simple that simple opportunities for us to feel joy together as a family is so precious. And the other smaller picture was um, when my younger daughter, right, she went back to school after the school holidays and so on. The first day she went back to school, she came back and she had flu-like symptoms. And I was like, okay, right, flu-like symptoms. She had sore throat, we are running nose. Okay, the responsible thing to do is must see doctor. So we went to see the doctor. Of course, the doctor, to be safe, ordered a swab test. The swab test took a few days to come, during which she still had those symptoms. And then I had to manage the family, right? Like, we still have to have proper social distancing to make sure things are okay. And I had to manage my own emotions. I was worried and I was praying a lot. But I, I realized that uh, as a mother, I, I set the tone in the family, right? If I'm worried, I get everybody else angry. I get my daughter, uh, daughter anxious uh, as well. And so I had to make sure that everybody's okay. We continue, you know, we pray together. We talk about continuing plan B, you know, if, if it's positive, we don't have to be afraid. God is still in control. There are certain things that we can pack if we need to go and try to make things light, you know, and at the same time, just praying and casting my cares and anxieties upon God. And four days later, you know, when the report came out that, She's clear, and then we were all so happy, you know, again experiencing the joy together as a family. And you see the red color stuff, that's strawberry cake. I bought, I brought her favorite strawberry cake and we celebrated as a family. And so there are all these different opportunities that even as we celebrate God's goodness, we, we did also debrief as a family to say that, you know, it, it doesn't matter, it, it doesn't mean that when we clear this time, that in the future we will always be clear. Right? As a family, we should always be prepared for something else that might come along the way. Right? Life, it's not realistic to just expect that life will be smooth sailing for everyone in the family. Uh, and so I, I learned um, through this, really, this uh, COVID-19 season that we, we, need to, we journey together as a family. We prepare for contingencies as a family. Right? All the small little things matter. And how did I um, get to this mindset? I think Benny just now shared uh, one of the coping strategies, synergy. And this is a verse um, that I hang on to since uh, my children were very young. Deuteronomy 6, verse 6 to 9. Verses 6 to 9. Actually, God has already given in the Bible certain times of the day that we can harness for those small, small little things, right? He has called families, called parents to teach the greatest commandment. Okay, the, the verses preceding this, uh, which I didn't show on this deck, 
it's really the greatest commandment, which is, which is you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. And verse 6 onwards, it says, And these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children. Not once in a while. It's diligently to your children. And you shall talk to them, talk to them when you sit at your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. Actually, these are certain, these are actually moments in the day that we are called to teach the greatest commandment to our children. And so when, when I had a revelation of this early, uh, it, it, when my children were younger, I made it very intentional, right? When we sit in our house, what, most of the time when we come to our house and it's meal time, meal time is the time that I protect. I protect like a hawk. No phones, you know, why are you using your phone? Okay, and if they see me using a phone, they will ask me uh, respectfully, Mommy, is that important? And then I'll catch myself and say, Oh, I'm sorry, you're more important. Okay, I put down my phone. <laughs> right? So when we sit at our house, there are opportunities that we can protect, that we can talk, that we can build that bond together. The next point, when we walk by the way, right? When we, in the past, when we can go out more often, sometimes there are things that we can see along the road or, or images that we see or certain situations that come up, right? And we say, Oh, what do you think of that? You know, is that uh, aligned to what God wants us to do? What, what are your views? And nowadays, when the kids are older, they are on social media, sometimes they will show me a meme, you know, and I will ha 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 laugh with them for a bit. And sometimes I, I don't understand what the meme tries to say, but, but I laugh with them, you know, and process it. What does it mean? Actually, that's not a very nice thing to say, right? You know, and, and things like that. So there are certain things that we can use as opportunities to talk about values as well. The third point, when we lie down, okay, bedtime is actually usually a time where we, we feel more relaxed, you know, the children will feel more relaxed and it's a time where we can pray a blessing over them we, uh, and sometimes they would, you know, at bedtime ask the weirdest, well, not weirdest questions, but most interesting questions, right, because they feel safe, right, and I find that the nighttime moments, even now when my girls are teenagers, those are very precious, I lay my hands on them, I pray with them, pray God's peace and the Abrahamic best blessing to be upon them, and they feel so peaceful, and they can transit to sleep, right, and then the last point is when they get up, when we get up, what is the routine in the home, right? Is it very rushed or, or is it actually possible to, to be a time when we sit down and do quiet time or encourage when they're older, we encourage them to do quiet time on their own. When they were younger, I used to do it together during breakfast and we read a devotion together and things like that. But now when they're older, I would prompt them to you know, do their own devotion. Now as a family, we are reading uh, Dr. Josh McDowell and Sean McDowell's Evidence That Demands a Verdict. We have like a tap for each one of our names and we see how far each one of us goes. Uh, but that's what we can do. And so my encouragement uh, for all of us is actually we can make full use of daily opportunities, right? Nicole shared about, you know, the small things matters to her. Uh, Benny also mentioned the synergy, the, the kind of identity as a family. It doesn't just come like that. It's built over time through intentionality, through moments, right? That God has already indicated that there are certain moments. If we can open our eyes and be intentional about them, that's when we can build, build the synergy. That when the next crisis comes, it may not be COVID-19, it could be something else, right? It could be haste, it could be whatever, right? We have that, that strong bonds to ride through whatever that comes. And it's actually daily opportunities that's available to us. In my household, we also have this verse, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Um, we have it as visual reminders on our doors. Uh, as they leave, they see that. When they come back, it's also outside my door. When they come home, it's the first thing that we see. But I want to highlight how we implement this. And taking the core as example is really to first start in the home. We build that team, that synergy first by allowing the children to have opportunities or encouraging them to be part of the team. The first team that they should be in is actually the family. As parents, we are leaders and the first team that we lead is our family, right? We want to build this team that's synergistic, that's so close bond, that has the same mission, then the same vision of what a family aims to do. And so from young, the children have opportunities to contribute 
uh, I, I will always encourage and say, hey, you're such a good team member. You know, I do my part, you do your part, and we can all be stronger together. And during COVID-19, um, the children really rise up to the occasion. There are times when I was busy, and then they would rise up and, and make meals for us you know, without complaining. And they actually slowly actually grow to enjoy cooking, even though not every meal sometimes is not very successful. You know, we learn from it, uh, but that we learn together and we encourage one another. But it starts first with self in the home, giving them response possibilities and letting them feel a sense of belonging. The next phase would be to then, how can I encourage the children to influence their spheres of influence uh, to, or, or the, the, the immediate spheres? Okay, so the picture that I'm sharing with you is, is the program Fam Chance that uh, Nicole shared earlier where she had the opportunity uh, to learn, uh, to go for the camp and then she went for the songwriting course and so on. But it started with me, a very, <laughs> very enthusiastic family champion. I went to the school. It was a new program at that time. I went to the school. I asked to speak to the vice principal and I tried to like pitch the program saying so well, you know, whatever that the school need to do. I and with the parent support group, I will come and support you, whatever it means. You just tell me I will do and I will offload the teacher to do it. And then ultimately, Nicole was the first batch of fan chants uh, in her school. And it was, uh, and since then, every year there have been fam family champions raised in the school. And so she feels that she, so extending from the family, she went out to serve with her school. And now as she gets older, uh, she mentioned recently that we did a course together and so actually the step before this week before we went out to, to the public at large it's actually we did it for her poly friends uh, she was uh, starting starting year two and she was you know within a group where they say hey let's welcome all the year ones coming in and then she did like a induction kind of thing and then I, I thought hey since they are still having holidays uh, why don't we try to do a follow-up you know uh, to this group of uh, year ones let's do this together with them and, and so that group, it, the feedback was very good. And so we have been having two public runs after that. And as we do this, uh, serve together as mother and daughter, having intergenerational conversation, I just find that it's so amazing when the young people come together and figure out, you know, what, what is it that, what, why has God put us in this cultural moment? Why has God given us all this technology that's around us what is it he has actually given us as an, an assignment and in this course we will talk about it but i just wanted to highlight through through this story uh, of my experience it's really to say that discipleship starts in the home very often we want to go change the world we want to make disciples of all nations right but the first disciples should be our children our first disciples are living in our home right what if all of us take great responsibility and honor to steward the life that God has given us. Can you imagine if the president gives us her child to raise? How would we take care of the child? And God has given us our children to raise, right? His children to raise, right? We, we need to really take that seriously. And if we, if we take the concept that, you know, begin with the end in mind. When, when the children are in the teenage years, we know that they are growing up in a more and more complex environment, right? Things are uh, more than 50 shades of grey, right? And, and all the more we need to take it seriously and, and really do things in developmentally appropriate ways to support them so that they can be strong and resilient when they uh, are out on their own. Oops. Uh, okay. Yeah, uh, I know my time is running out, so I will talk about it towards the end. Uh, maybe we can talk about it at the end as well. Uh, yeah, but maybe I'll hang on to this one first, one minute. Okay, Jason, I know my time is running out. Um, you are the first people to hear this publicly, right? Salt and Light, right, which is a Christian uh, online uh, portal. Uh, we are launching a Family Night on the 4th of August at, from 9 to 10 o'clock. Okay, it's pretty much like what we're having tonight, but it's not going to be two hours. It's going to be bite-sized for families, and we're going to talk about different issues of family. It could be relating to children or relating to our own parents or in-laws or mental health. How do we nurture our children's mental health? How do we help them through various transitions and things like that? So every fortnight from 4th of August onwards, okay, we will be on Zoom as well. So look out for publicity that's coming up in Salt and Light, okay?
Yeah, so thank you very much. Uh, yeah, so let's all raise resilient disciples together, starting from our home. Thanks. Over to you, Jason. Thank you, Carol. That's wonderful. I really like the part where you say, uh, uh, at home we don't wear masks. At home we remove our masks. <laughs> you know, my daughter's been putting on the mask every day to work and now she's giving her pimple. So, <laughs> Now, thank you, Carol. Uh, I think you have given us a lot of uh, wonderful tips, especially discipleship starts at home. That's where we start. If we disciple our children well, then they can become uh, family champions in the community and for their generation. Now, uh, I will share with you for a few minutes after which we can have uh, the q and I can see that uh, the Q&A, some of you are already coming in with a number of questions, so continue to, uh, to uh, key in those uh, questions. And if you like a particular question, uh, feel free to uh, upvote it, meaning uh, give it a thumbs up so that the more uh, pop popular a particular question is, then it will go to the top and then we will definitely want to look at the particular question afterwards. So this is my family. I have two children and uh, one wife. And uh, you can see uh, when this photo was taken, it was taken during uh, uh, Christmas season and uh, uh, Crew Media, Crew Singapore, Campus Crusade, the former Campus Crusade, wanted to do a, a, a magazine article. So they were looking for families to interview. And so the photographer came and asked us to just look at each other, look at each other and take a photo. And so, well, uh, that's how the photo came about. But it, it's just uh, representing the hearts of the family members supposed to turn towards each other. Because the opposite is that we will turn away, right? So COVID-19, uh, this period, some of us are turning towards each other as uh, what uh, Carol has said, the family coming together, even as what uh, Benny has said, you know, we need to synergize, you know, turn towards each other, support each other. But of course, a uh, crisis like that can also cause us to turn away from each other, to turn against each other. That's how uh, the, the tension, the violence come about. Uh, my daughter is already 25 years old. My son is 20. And it's interesting because uh, now my son is the national service. Um, and just now we heard from Nico. I mean, even the teenager can champion family. You know, if you believe in the family, you can champion family with or without COVID. Uh, mm -hmm. And my son is in national service. And guess what? We're actually entrusting the whole nation into uh, the 19, 20 years old. You know, they are officers. They carry the weapon. They are protecting our nation. But why can't we expect young people to also protect the family and to champion the family. Mm -hmm. So uh, because family is the foundation, family is the basic building block. Uh, no, I like the Chinese version, just two words, guo jia. You can see the word jia inside the word guo jia. Uh, so family is basic foundation of a nation. You know? mm -hmm. And uh, of course, we need to ask ourselves, where does family come from? You know? And family comes from the beginning, right at the beginning. And I think it's important for myself, every now and then, you know, uh, especially during crisis situa situations, I will ask myself, okay, God, family is your design. You created the world, you created everything, and you created family. So you know, in the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, he created man in this image, male and female, he created them. And he said, God bless them and say to them, be fruitful, increase in number, fill the earth. Now, it, if we were to break it down into the order of relationship, you can see God created man, so there's a God-man relationship. Male and female, so there's a husband and wife relationship. Be fruitful, so there's a parents and child relationship. This is the order. Now, you realize that in the COVID situation, these three relationships have been affected. Some become stronger, some starts to break. And uh, so if we want to shape family, we will need to shape these three relationships. Uh, the closer we are to God, the vertical relationship, then we can also strengthen the marriage relationship and then the parent-child, the child-parent relationships. You know, I call it the upstream, midstream, and downstream. You know, when we have issues with our children, there's tension. Usually, there are also issues midstream, which is the marriage relationship. If we have issues with the marriage, usually we have issues in the first relationship, which is the vertical relationship with God. Mm. So I would encourage ourselves as Christians, you know, in the crisis, when we are stressed, we are tense, go back to drawing from God, the source of love, the source of forgiveness. Now, let me touch on uh, Leviticus uh, 18, because this is where we talk about relationships, sexual relationships in particular. Then the Lord said to Moses, give the following instructions to the people of Israel. I am the Lord your God, so do not act like the people in Egypt where you used to live or the people of Canaan where I'm taking you. 
you must obey all the regulations and be careful to obey my decrees. For I am the Lord your God. If you obey my decrees and my regulations, you will find life through them. So you can see, God was basically telling his people, you know, I mean, the, the nation of Israel always go through crises, all sorts of crises they will go through. And God was telling the people, uh, his people, the people of uh, Israel, do not follow other nations. Follow my instructions, my regulations. And God said, if you follow, then there will be life. Because if we do not follow, we move away from God's instructions. The opposite of life is actually death. The opposite of life is actually despair and hopelessness. Now, let me describe using a diagram. God's design for family, whether COVID-19, no COVID-19, regardless, throughout the whole generations for thousands of years, is this man and woman be fruitful, hearts turn towards each other. The love, you know, uh, we, we are supposed to support each other. You know, and as, as uh, Benny was saying, you make the trumpet call, we come together for each other. But we have been moved away. We have deviated, right? Because if we put God one side, if we are, our relationship is not strong with, with, with God, and if we turn our hearts away from God, if we backslide, then our relationship will start to be torn apart. Our, we will turn away from each other. We, we, there will be tension. And of course, there is uh, uh, relationships outside the marriage. Yeah. Premarital relationships, adultery. Then of course, if we keep moving in this direction, we will see other forms of families, other forms of relationships. And if we follow God's design, God said there will be life. So there will be benefits. There are blessings. There's life. But if we move away, there will be cause and consequences. And as you can see, there are more reports about family violence, child abuse cases, and it is really sad, right? If we move away from God's design. Now, as we have heard earlier, strong families mean strong nations. So what happens in the home, like as Carol was saying, if we decide the home well, it impacts the nation. So it has to be one family at a time, one marriage at a time, one child at a time. Uh, but we move away from here, then the whole nation will start to go down. Question, where is Singapore? Where is Singapore? Uh, well, I think we are not up there. We are not as strong as we used to. We are also not as bad as um, many other nations, especially the so-called progressive na nations, you know, uh, where we pursue wealth, we pursue uh, our own self-interests. -in I think the call is for all of us to go back to God's design, to go back to what God has intended in the Garden of Eden. And to go back to God's design, to shape family according to God's uh, intent would be to shape these three relationships. Now, uh, let me share with you what is happening in the world, in the church, right? Uh, I know some of us may not be Christians, but my understanding as I speak to pastors, I speak to people in the churches, is that whether the church or in the nation, the state of the family, we are getting weaker and weaker. Divorce cases, uh, hearts are turned away. We are so busy with our own life, right? With our own work. But if we can shape family, then we are going to turn the church around. You know, with first we start with our own community. And, but this is not good enough because even if we have strong families within ourselves, but the nation is going down. If the nation is going down, the nation will pull us down as well, right? Uh, it is our role, it is our, our call to help the nation to have strong families as well. And of course, uh, how do we do that? How do we shape families? We shape family by being family champion, by championing family, by believing in family, by living it out and advocating, spreading, promoting. You know, earlier, Carol talked about uh, Deuteronomy, the, 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 the verse uh, Deuteronomy 6. It's about walking. It's about living. It's about lying down. It's about talking, you know? So it is about living out God's design. Not just we believe, but we need to live out what we believe. And then if we believe in it enough, we should start talking about it and spreading it. So we can be family champions. Of course, first at home, as Carol was saying, start in the home discipleship. And then in our church, you know, uh, in the community, in the marketplace, we begin to shape family. We begin to shape families in the nation. Just give you an example. Even I, for myself, I have one family. I do every my best. I'm not a perfect husband, not a perfect father. So I, I, I try to strengthen my marriage relationship, my relationship with my children. And during the COVID situation, my wife and I, we, we now, uh, at one time, we cannot go to the beach to walk. So we start doing exercises at home, you know, to keep our relationship strong. 
uh, well, uh, I know that there is no time for me to talk uh, about my own family, uh, but later maybe the Q&A, but I've decided to uh, August the 2nd, I'm going to uh, do this together with my wife. Uh, the lessons that I've learned after 25 years of being a father uh, and, and uh, over 28 years of, uh, of, of, uh, of marriage life. Now, so one family, but we can also begin to shape the families in the churches. So some of you have heard of Elijah 7,000 and that's where we reach Christian fathers and we encourage Christian fathers to, to be good husbands, to be involved with their children. Now, the imp important thing is, is this. We have learned that we cannot do it on our own. You know, the best way to shape family is that we come together uh, in that synergistic relationship to, to do it in community, to help each other, to support each other. Uh, when we, I'm down, someone can lift me up. When I'm strong, I can lift someone up. And my experience, his experience, we can share with each other. And because of COVID now, we are seeing a growing number of fathers coming together through Zoom. It's so easy now. You don't have to take bus. You don't have to find car park. You, know, you don't have to waste time traveling. You don't, even have to, you don't even need different rooms for breakout rooms. You just sit in the same chair. You go into breakout rooms and you can start sharing your pain, your struggles, and you have fellow brothers and, and fathers to pray over you. So we are actually seeing more and more fathers, you know, those who are struggling and they reach out and then I will say, why don't you come for this group? Why don't you come for prayers? Why don't you come and join this support group? Now, not just in the church, but also in the community because God says all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. So some of us have authority in the schools, in the government, in our company. So for example, uh, on the bottom left is a school. Right? We have been given earthly authority and we can reach families, reach fathers, reach uh, uh, moms in the school. And bottom right here is the, the uh, company. It's a lunch talk that I gave. And of course, even in the army camp, if you are a battalion commander, you can actually shape families in the battalions, in the army camps. You can shape families in the school, in the company. Of course, now we can't do it live, but through Zoom. I've been actually doing some of these talks through, through, through Zooms now. And lastly, you know, during the COVID period, in fact, this is 21st of June, which is on Father's Day. The government actually launched this Made for Families brand mark, launched to show support for families amid the COVID-19 pandemic. And this is actually by the strategy group, by in the Prime Minister's office. When I saw this, Together Singapore is Made for Families, wouldn't it be wonderful in a post-COVID Singapore that Singapore is known as a place, as a country that is made for families. And to do this, of course, we need to shape family by being family champions who believe in family, live out family, and then we champion family. First, in our own home, that's very important, in our own church, in the marketplace, and in our community. So now, uh, with that, I'd like to bring our panel list back to have our Q&A, right? Now, I hope uh, what Benny has shared, Carol, Nicole, and myself have shared have been helpful, but I think this is where all your questions uh, can be answered if we had not addressed it during our sharing. Uh, now, I can see that there are about nine questions from nine different people, and we can all take a look at it. And right at the top, uh, we have uh, from Sister Yvonne, who have asked two questions. Uh, so I will read the question and any of the panel members can just, uh, just jump in and just uh, answer. How can we develop a posture of gratitude and contentment in our children in a post-COVID world without using fear and without over-sensationalizing the negative impact of COVID-19? The second question is, how can we develop our children to have hearts and mindsets of wanting to make a positive difference and positive impact on the world. See a need, feel a need. Mm -hmm. Anyone? I, I, I was looking at the question and, and, and what struck me was how a lot of what we are trying to impart, we, we can't impart unless we have it. Uh, we, we can't impart compassion Gratitude, spirit of gratitude, unless we have it. So I think it, it begins with us as parents. Um, and even when we say, you know, uh, in the question, how do we not uh, trigger more anxiety and fear in our children, uh, especially when they look at the future? I, I think it begins with us not being fearful, um, not, not 
in a simplistic fashion, not, not like a, an ostrich burying the head in the sand and says, well, God will take care of everything. But being very clear, uh, I, I, I shared with you earlier on about Jeremiah. Uh, what I, I think you should also know is that although God says, I know my plans, they are for your well-being, uh, the people had to wait. 70 years before the fulfillment of that promise. Now, the promise will be fulfilled, but what God was teaching was the need for that patient faithfulness to believe in Him, even if it took 70 years for it to come. So likewise, I think we, we, we want to teach these very, very positive values, but we need to begin with believing in ourselves, modeling ourselves. Um, I think one of the questions down the road uh, says it very clearly that, that uh, values are not necessarily taught. It's, it's caught. Uh, and, and you know that, that, that our kids are constantly uh, observing us. Um, one writer puts it that kids are like sponges. You know, they, 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 they just soak up everything around them. And so if there's animosity in the home, they'll soak it up. There's pessimism in the home, they'll soak it up. Now, if there's anxiety, worry in the home, they're, they're going to soak it up because uh, that's what is the most dominant atmosphere in the home. Thank you, Benny. Mm -hmm. Carol or Nico, would you like to? Yeah, so uh, when the children were younger, uh, we had a gratitude chart. So uh, mm -hmm. I was sharing that there are mm -hmm. certain times of the day that we can harness. So mm -hmm. at bedtime, uh, part of our routine when they were younger was to have a gratitude chart and they are supposed to write down what they are thankful for. Nicole, you want to talk a little bit about that? Do you remember? Yeah. Okay, I'm, I'm not going to lie, right? When I was like younger, <laughs> then every time she would ask us, oh, can you write on your gratitude chart? And I'm just kind of be like, but I don't want to do it today. And like, it's so, to me, when I was younger, it felt like a chore. It felt like an extra thing to take off my list and just do it because mommy says so. But then um, now I look back and I think uh, it kind of sowed seeds in a way because like, I really find uh, the little things to be grateful for in everyday life. So mm -hmm. yeah, that was just my take on the gratitude charts. Mm -hmm. So they can write or they, they write and then they date it. So as they do it over the months or the weeks, they actually fill up the drawing block. It's not just a very simple drawing block that we mm -hmm. put next to the wall. So before they sleep, I'll just I'll remind them, what are you thankful for? And then they'll write. Sometimes they will draw. And as the drawing block gets full, the, the A4 side gets full, I will actually put it into our family yearbook. So we have a family yearbook. And over time, it's like really physically counting the blessing. Do you remember that you were blessed with this? And so it's a building of habit. And I think Yvonne, this is such a great question because the, the posture of gratitude is really a very important virtue that we, we need our children to have. And as for contentment, uh, especially for the older kids when they're on social media, they would see a lot of other things that make them, you know, very easily want to compare, oh, other people got this, therefore I also need to have this. Mm. Uh, and, and so that conversation about, uh, you know, affirming them, you know, whatever mm. that we have, we might not have much, but we are still okay, we are doing well, we are still healthy, mm. and we can be thankful for that as well. And, and so that con constant tugging them back rather than whatever that they see on social media, oh, I must look that way, or mm. I must have, I must be macho like that, you know, but to, to say that, you know, God has created you, you are fearfully and wonderfully mm. made, mm. and that constant affirmation and assurance uh, and constantly throughout the children's growing years really uh, will bear good fruits when the children are older. Mm. Wonderful. You know, to this uh, second question by Yvonne, how can we develop our children to have hearts and minds, mm. mindset of wanting to make mm. a positive difference, positive impact on the world, see a need, feel mm. a need. Uh, mm. I remember my own journey, I guess, uh, I, I, you know, as Penny said, we, we have to live the value that we want mm. to teach. We have to model mm. the value. Mm. And uh, looking back, uh, when my children were young, my wife and I, uh, I mean, we, 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 together with the cell mem mem members in the church, uh, we did some uh, free tuition ministry. Mm -hmm. We brought our daughter along. Even though she was like six years old, she was the assistant tutor for the kiddie group. Uh, and, then, <clears throat> like, uh, uh, and then as parents, we actually organized uh, short mission trips. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we brought the children along. And I remember my daughter, she was much older then, but you know, like, she didn't know what to do, right? But, she actually made some of those uh, cute little paper cranes, you know, mm. and it's very colorful. She brought it along. So, and we, when we visited from, 
house to house in the village. I mean, they are very poor, mm. and my daughter couldn't like. She's still young. She didn't know what mm. to say, how to, how to even pray. But she will always, uh, when the adults are about to leave, she will mm. just give a paper crane mm. <laughs> to the old lady mm. or mm. or to the family until the, the. I mean, to them it's like so cute, mm. so fun. Mm. They will smile, mm. and so so I, I think that as as adults, uh, we can start by modeling. And mm. then exposing our children little by little, and mm. hopefully they will catch. They will mm. catch it. Yeah, yeah. I I I like to say something if I may. Um, you know when 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 you look at the news around the world, um, you know we 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 are getting a very well. I for me it's an unexpected message, and the message is that the new generation, the young ones, are not as Self-centered, as we tend to write them off to be, you know, we 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 tend to think that the young are are very entitled, very self-centered, very me me. Um, but whilst that may be true for some segments, there are many young people who are now taking up causes, wanting to look at changing the environment, going green, wanting to clear up rubbish, wanting to put an end to fossil fuels. Feels they they are not necessarily set up to want to be more socially active and socially conscious. Um, I I I think that that's not just something happening in the West or a trend. I think the young are always looking for a cause that they believe in that makes sense to them. They're still very idealistic. Uh, it's us who are the older generation who will say. Hey, study first. You know, think about your future. You know, uh, don't go to jail. You know, we 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 tend to dampen some of this natural spirit, the exuberance that they have uh, by all our concerns. Um, so, if you are thinking how to enliven the spirit, then we may have to ask: Are there some things that I'm doing that deadens it? Are there some things that I'm doing that, without thinking, I'm discouraging it because of my own fear, my own anxiety, my own short-sightedness? So, so maybe it's a question we need to ask ourselves too. Mm, yeah, wonderful, Jason, Benny. Maybe, Jason, maybe, Jason yeah. can. Oh, sorry. Go on, go on. Yes, please. Can, can I take one minute? I think since the uh, topic covers about well, see a need and feel it, um, mm -hmm. I think Nicole wants to share something because uh, she mm -hmm. saw a need and went what did what she could to feel it. Nicole, mm -hmm. go ahead. Yeah, so actually, it, it wasn't just me. It was really a, a group of us. It started with me and a, a pastor from one of the churches in Singapore. We just uh, were talking and we really felt like we had like this uh, same level of burden for the younger people in our generation, mm. especially like, you know, we're all online now, right? Like, mm. if we're online now. Yeah, and um, we really saw the need that um, there is a need for the young men online to have content that's relatable for them, and it's not something that degrades other people or um, has like foul language. So that was the need that uh, we felt needed to be filled, and so we ended up with uh, Philotimo. Yeah, it's here. So. If you can see the Greek word is yeah Philotimo, it is the love of honor and self sacrifice and those are the values we really hope all men are able to have or if not just mm. work toward. And so this is an account. It's run for youth by youth. We have a group of us who really feel strongly about being positive change in media and sometimes where it can be dark and negative. We mm. wanted to really mm. be positive lights in mm. media. And we also knew that, like, you know, young men do need anchors and healthy father figures to navigate through life mm. with. And so, um, yeah, if you could see, that's, that's one of our influencers. We have more coming up. So, mm. yeah, follow us for more Christian content mm. and see the rest of the influencers who are coming up real soon. Mm. And so I really hope this is relevant for you and for the younger folks. And do mm. share our posts with your friends. Yeah. Right. Wonderful. <laughs> yeah, actually... Thanks, Carol. I was about to direct the, the, mm. the Nicole to actually uh, share with us what young people are doing these days. Yeah. Mm. So wonderful, wonderful. Let's move forward to the next question. Uh, if my family relationships were already strained prior mm. to the pandemic, how or where do I start to improve my family's relationship? Talking about past hurts is a no-go. 
of course, I envy how other families seem to improve their relationship with each other. So those who have been affected mm. by the pandemic, mm. or maybe some of them were already uh, mm. having weak relationships even before the pandemic. Yeah, so mm. now they are at the stage where they need to do something about it. What would be the mm. advice? I, I, I think when, when, whenever I, I work with um, troubled families and, and couples and, and sometimes, you know, uh, whole family units are at odds with each other. Um, what, one of the things that, that strikes me as I listen to them is that there are usually a few voices, maybe very tentative voices coming from the people who are hoping that, can we turn this ship around? Can, can we, like in Jason's drawing, you know, not be looking outward but inward? Um, can we make an, an attempt? Uh, but there's a lot of fear. There's a lot of fear that, am I the only one who is interested in improving things? Um, if I say I'm sorry, will you also say you're sorry? You know, or do I end up carrying the guilt of, of the whole family? So I, I think there's, there's a lot of apprehension uh, usually when people try to want to repair relationships. So my, my encouragement to you is one, uh, keep in mind that you may not be the only voice, that perhaps there are others in the family who also want to improve, but everybody is waiting for everybody, somebody else to take the first step. You know? uh, so if you really feel it bothers me, it's important to me, uh, and I can sit on my hands and wait for others to make a change or I can want to do something about it. Yeah. So my first uh, word of encouragement is, you know, uh, keep in mind that others may be also thinking about it. Number two is that um, my second word of encouragement is think about the ripple effect. The ripple effect is like when you throw a stone into a pond and you see that splash of water going out. Sometimes, that's what happens when you make that first initiative. You may not see the change today, but you have planted a seed, a seed of change. You know? So it may be a seed that you would harvest, you would you know, come back to a little later. So think about that. And of course, the third is, you know, sometimes it's good to have a mediator. Uh, it could be a family member. It could be a, a, a friend. It could be a, a person that you entrust. It could be a counselor but bring a mediator in because sometimes it takes a mediator to kind of say, you know, uh, come on guys, you're all on the same page and I can hear you out. Uh, this morning I was listening to a couple and they, they were talking about whether they should divorce, whether they should stay together, whether they should work on a marriage. And I said, you know, you guys, I hear two things that are very clear that you have complete agreement on, you know, uh, and, and so sometimes a mediator gives them that, that perspective, uh, the perspective where even sometimes our own pride comes in our way. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, thanks, Benny. Carol, any inputs? Uh, I was just thinking about my own relationship mm -hmm. uh, with mm -hmm. my husband. Uh, maybe just a little bit of quick context. Um, I was a backslider. Uh, I married into a Taoist home. I only came back to the Lord when I was pregnant with my younger one, who is now 15. Um, and I started to, when I was pregnant with my girl, I started to go back to church because I figured that it's getting very hard to be a parent these days. <laughs> and I thought, mm -hmm. maybe I should just try church. I at least got some anchors. And, mm -hmm. and that's how I started my journey back to church. But then at that time, my husband uh, was still a very strong uh, Thai Buddhist. He actually turned yeah. into a Thai Buddhist. Um, and so I had huge struggle for three years. Uh, our relationship uh, was strained because I found a, a big heart pain whenever I see Nicole at that time. She would sit on his lap and then pray to the altar every morning. He was very pious. I mean, he has a good heart. He wants to do it for the family. But I had huge struggle. Uh, and I think it strained my relationship. But I think what helped me together was really um, praying. I know it's just like, just pray. But I think we praying really makes a difference because then I, I know that there are certain things that a wife cannot do that only God can do. 
But at least if I see and envision myself that it's okay, I can't do it, but God can do it. One day it's going to be okay, however long it takes. Um, and so it, it was about three years later that my, my husband was, uh, it was saved. Yeah, mm. but during that three, it was, it was very tough. And really it took uh, a lot of prayer. And mm. it took, um, the Bible talk about, you know, as wise is how we behave, you know, with gentleness. Uh, and I think when I deal with myself first, mm. Um, that helps in terms of how mm. I speak to my husband. I may not agree with every decision that he made, but at least I do what I can mm. to preserve the relationship and, and to envision for myself that it, it, it's okay. You know, it, God is in control. When I commit the relationship to God uh, and pray about it and I start to journal, I, I brought him a, a Bible and I leave notes in the Bible. And when he mm. got sick, he looked at the Bible and it was so precious. And, and so I think my encouragement is, I think it starts with ourselves. Mm. We, mm. we commit the relationship to God and God will, will do great things for us and through us. Thanks, thanks, Carol. Mm. You know, I, I have a, a, couple, a couple of people that uh, reach out to, to me uh, during this mm. period. And uh, they were having relationships, they were strained. And, mm. and after, after speaking to them, I realized that uh, sometimes it's not just uh, family members, uh, but mm. they themselves. Uh, so mm. so they, they, they need help themselves. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Uh, that's where I will refer, especially their fathers, I will ask mm. them to join up with the father's group, a father's mm. community. So mm. they, 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 have, they have support. They, they can mm. call out whatever you know, struggles mm. that people just come alongside to pray over them, to support them. And then mm. to also learn from each other and pick up some of these uh, tools mm. that they can bring back. Mm. So I think some of them have found this helpful. Yeah. Let's go to the next question. Mm. Uh, it's, wow, it's a national policy question, right? Mm. What policies are helpful towards strengthening the family units and at the mm. same time not compromising our competitiveness as an economy. Mm. So, <laughs> I, 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 I want to jump right into this question because when I saw it, it, it really got to me. Um, why, why must things be always so binary? You know, either or, yes or no, you know, where, and, and this, this binary uh, form of the question, it, it uh, and even as, as, I, as, as I said this, I know within myself, that's also how very often I think, you know, that if we put too much emphasis on the family, if we go soft, uh, and, and uh, then our economy will suffer, you know, and then, you know, uh, what's the point of having strong families and a weak economy? But I'm, I think this binary way of thinking is not always the best form, you know, because especially in this time of COVID, many people from other countries look to Singapore, you know, and, and I know we, it sounds like we are blowing our trumpet here, but look to Singapore as a safe haven where they want to raise their family here, where they feel that the policies are good because it's very family-centric, where health system may be good, you know. So when we place an emphasis on the family, we build strong families. And, and I like what Jason, you shared about the, the announcement. We build strong families. We become an attraction to others who want to come to a place where the family is given uh, an opportunity to grow, to be strong. So I think this idea of policies to build strong families is not at odds with our competitive, competitiveness. In fact, if, if people are happier as a workforce, they will be able to be more productive as a workforce, you know, and, and we can also attract the best talents, you know, that, that we have in the world. Um, I think that this idea of uh, policies, the setting up of this national committee seems like a step in a good direction because when you talk about policies, it's wide ranging. You're looking at laws, you're looking at labor laws, you're looking at uh, provisions in education. Uh, but let's just, let me just take one item there in terms of employment. We know that when COVID hits the world, it is the women who suffer more. Yeah. Especially when um, jobs are lost, oftentimes it's more disproportionately women who lose their work. Especially when the home has to double up as a place to teach children, to raise children, it's the mothers who have to double up, even if they're having a full-time job. So somewhere in our thinking, it, it, it's still the mentality that it's the man's world, the man's job has to be kept. And, and if women, if men do 
housework. I, I remember this client many years ago. He quoted very proudly and said, you know, this time, remember, I helped mop the floor. You know? It was like one time out of years, he took a mop and he, he cleaned the floor and it was supposed to be etched on the wall that we must remember. It. I, there, there needs to be a bit more egalitarian sharing of roles because now women folk are pulling more than their weight in bringing in the money, bringing the bacon and doing more than their weight in taking care of things in the home. So when we think about laws, policies, uh, it, it should be equal to recognize uh, we, we should be thinking of you know, paternity leave as much as we think of maternity leave. Uh, why is it that when we think of the school calling up the parent when the child is sick, must always call up mother? Uh, why can't it be fathers? You know, why, why, why do fathers get off from that kind of responsibility? So I, I think it's, it's policies, but more than policies, it's a mindset change. Yeah. Wonderful. Thanks, yeah. Benny. Um, I'm going to leave the next question to mm. Carol and Nicole. Mm. <laughs> you mm. know, on this policy question, mm. if I could just jump in a little. Mm. Um, mm. Uh, you, you realize that government has already introduced paternity leave, mm. but mm. they also realize that the, in terms of the take up, it's not as high as it should be. Mm. <laughs> uh, mm. So I think policy is one level. And then mm. the next level is whether companies are encouraging the fathers yes. to take it. Mm. And whether fathers themselves uh, mm. feel that they should be taking it. You know? mm. So, mm. so some of this policy can also come down to a very personal level. Mm. How sure. do we mm. want to prioritize? Huh? Yeah. So let's, let's go to the next question. I would like to suggest mm. that the next question will be the last question. Mm. And uh, after this, uh, those of you who want to, to have uh, the rest of the question answered, you can stay back after the announcements at the end. So the next question we've, will, will be the last question uh, for this uh, segment is uh, from Ivy. I am from the baby Zoomers uh, generation. I find it hard to mentor the younger generation, those in the early 30s, yeah, in the aspects of Christian marriages and Christian parenting worldviews. I guess the culture and some values had changed but how do we get them to embrace what is good? Yeah. Christian. Nicole, you want to go first? <laughs> yeah. From a young person's perspective? <laughs> but this is for early 30s. <laughs> eh. <laughs> what? You, we will get there at some point. How, how, do you, yeah, how do you get your perspective in terms of your know, Christian worldview? Or how do you get to embrace what is good? How do you discern what is good? At 18. Mm, yeah. So I think... There's two aspects to it. One is definitely finding the answers on my own. But then um, I think when I do that, I can only go so far. I know Google is my best friend, but like Google isn't that great all the time, right? So yeah, you know, I'm smiling so you all agree with me. And I think the other half of it is when I see stuff on social media and on Google, right? Um, there are so many voices nowadays and we don't really know which voices to, mm. to believe in. Uh, at some point so um, that's where I think the anchors come in and I don't know if you heard it just now but yeah um, like when me and my mom like have that talk and now also like uh, my dad comes into the conversation as well and like we just discuss it together um, talking through the different perspectives on a certain topic does help so I think um, that is kind of a part that the family plays as well to really be the anchor and um, find clarity in a world where there are a lot of voices. Mm. Good job, mom. <laughs> this is where I will pitch uh, our course. Okay, is it okay, Jason? One minute. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, uh, okay, go ahead. So is it here? Yeah, it's just here. Okay. How do we talk about this with young people? So this has been Nicole and my experience in terms of um, doing this. And, I, and we really enjoy doing this. And it's an intergenerational conversation. Because when we talk about worldview, we have the young people as well as the older ones who come to think about the world in terms of like five there are five worldview questions. You know, why are we here for? And that any religion, right? Uh, people of any faith will need to think about at some point in their lives, you know, where did the world come from? You know, is the world like just, just like that? Or are we just, you know, from, from uh, monkeys, you know, or, or things like that. And, and through that, uh, ground them to, to, or not ground them, but have a conversation and, and talk about, you know, 
do you really agree that the world is created? I mean, not just that the Bible says so, right? Do you really believe that when God said, let there be light and there was light, how did that ever happen? How can it ever happen? And so having this kind of real, very real conversation with young people and, and even with Nicole, right? So we will talk about evidence. You know, that there's so much evidence around it. There's the cosmopolitan cosmological kind of like different different kind of reason that if we are open to finding out together and we present it to the young people that say actually there are evidence if there's evidence would you believe it and if you believe it and do you believe that the bible is true do you believe that there are evidence that the bible is true and if the bible is true and then there is a creator would it be that the creator would have created our body for certain things to do a certain purpose and we, when we can get all these anchors figured out, then it's actually easier. And that's like a worldview conversation. When we can anchor them in a Christian worldview, then actually that worldview, applying that Christian lens, can apply to any issue that they see. It could be uh, applicable to not just areas of sexuality or technology. It's also how you use money, right? What, what is God's intention for work? Or when it comes to younger people studying, you know, what are you supposed to do when it comes to studying? Why do we have to study maths? Why do we have to study science? Actually, all these subjects give us a glimpse of the world. So when we, I find that in my conversation with young people, when I can relate to them in a very personal way, something that they can understand and feel, you know, and think for themselves, like what uh, Nicole said just now, right? To help them think for themselves, not to tell them that it's right and wrong, but to ask them, do you think that's right and wrong? Or right or wrong? And why do you think that is, that's not right? Or are you not sure? Having those conversations and having that trust and relationship with the young people or young adults make a lot of difference in my experience. Thank you. Thank you, Carol. Um, now, I'm going to give uh, every speaker uh, 30 seconds in the closing <laughs> to say something to all of you, something that they feel is important uh, for you to take away uh, in the, mm. these closing remarks. But before that, uh, uh, I also want to say something about the last question. Um, mm. uh, I, I realized that how we do family mm. will actually model and uh, impart something to the next generation. Because if you're always so stressed about family, we say, Aya, you know, Aya, children uh, stress me up, la. marriage is so painful, la. <laughs> you know, I can't balance work and, and family. La. You know, I think that our young people will say, yeah, if you are like that, why do I want to do family, right? Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, I know of uh, young people who grew up in quite broken families. Uh, mm -hmm. They have given up on the institution of marriage because it didn't work for our generation. And they felt that, well, why would they want to even do it for their generation? So I guess for us, we do need to, uh, if we believe in it, then we need to live it out and model it. Yeah. And so now for the other speakers, 30 seconds each. And then we will make some announcements and uh, Brother Georgie, uh, President of FGB, will do the closing. Anybody want to start? Yeah, youngest go first. Mm. Lah. Mm. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah. So um, I really think that um, it's really the baby steps that get us to you know, come closer as a family. And as a younger person, I know like you parents have a lot of resources, have a lot of things that in the community that like you talk about in regards to parenting and other topics, that's like, I feel that's 50% of the work because really the other 50 is, I can hear so many things, but it's really um, the end result and what I'm going to do with what I, what I hear from my parents and the other voices around me. So um, I really wanted to end with encouraging you parents that um, no matter where your kids are at right now, um, I want to encourage you that... Um, whatever seeds that you have that are sown, um, they're going to reap harvest sooner or later. Mm. And um, even though it's very tough, jiayo, and mm. <laughs> you got this, mm. keep sowing seeds because it's really going to help your kids in mm. the future and in, in the close future too. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Thank you, Nico. Mommy. I'll go next as her mom. Mm. Uh, I want to encourage not just the parents, but also those of us in this group who are singles. You might have spiritual children that are young people uh, around you, that you can still be a family to them, right? Be a mother to the motherless, be the father to the fatherless, and just reach out, reach out to shepherd their hearts and reconcile back, them back to God. It really takes relationship uh, for, for us to really turn culture back to God. Yeah, so I just encourage all of us, parents or not. Thank you, Carol. Benny? I want to go back to the idea that uh, 
with COVID, many changes will take place and, and many things will be re-evaluated, including the concept of what is a family, uh, what's the function of a family. Um, a reminder that, that of the many institutions that God has given us for humankind to survive, one of them was the family. And we all know the importance of having families and we all know the importance of giving our children a sense of a future and a sense of destiny. So let this COVID time be a call for us to keep performing this task. Now, our way of securing their future is not building a nest egg of a bundle of CPF money. It's now the time to give them a nest egg of skills and of values. And that will see them through many generations. Thank you, Benny. And uh, now for those of you who have been blessed by this uh, mm -hmm. uh, webinar, please go to the chat group, you know, just yeah, make some comments, uh, whether you've learned something, whether you have benefited, you know, uh, mm -hmm. say whatever you want to say in the chat box. Uh, for my 30 seconds, I just want to say that uh, no matter how broken our family relationships are, there's still hope because on the cross, on the cross, God has made peace. You know, there can be reconciliation, there is forgiveness, there is love. Uh, and we can love because God first loved us. We can accept someone that is unacceptable or unlovable because God has accepted us. And we can forgive because God has already forgiven us. Mm -hmm. So uh, I will leave that with you. And let me do some announcements before I hand back the time to Georgie. And for those of you who want to stay on after uh, we officially uh, end this uh, webinar, please feel free to do so. We are happy to answer the remaining questions uh, after this. Uh, so let's look at the uh, announcements. Next slide. Yeah, so f I, I'm sure in a webinar like this, there's no way we can cover every of your need or answer every of your question. So feel free to follow and access some of these resources that are available, our websites, our Facebook pages. Yeah, and this will be given to you uh, in, in, in the uh, follow-up email as well after the seminar. Next one. Uh, okay, I told you that uh, I will be sharing some of my own life experiences as uh, a husband, as a father, uh, 2nd August. So if you think that that will, will be something you can benefit from, uh, please uh, uh, register. Uh, next one. Carol, you want to say something? That's right. So uh, I mentioned earlier that uh, Generations of Virtue, we have been having uh, uh, different speakers to come and speak to us. So this Saturday, we are having Katie Faust. Uh, she is the founder of Them Before Us. And really, uh, she's going to talk about, uh, with all the cultural moments about you know, different sexual confusion and struggles, the real victims are actually the children. And she would really share her perspective and, and the various stories um, that her, her work involves. And then next Thursday night, uh, Glenn Stanton, he's from uh, Focus on the Family HQ in Colorado Spring. He will be talking about what does it mean to be a man or woman, boy or girl, father and mother, with all this cultural talk about, you know, fluidity. What, how do we raise a boy who is comfortable being a boy? So come and join us this Saturday morning uh, as well as next Thursday uh, night. Yeah, and this is the uh, course that uh, Nicole and I were sharing just now. It's going to be done during the upcoming July holidays, okay? This year is very special because we started the term in June. So in July, there's going to be a break. So in two weeks' time, a whole week, all right, uh, from 3 to 4.30, uh, Nicole and I will be available. We, we are very excited to run this again for young people. So since uh, they shouldn't be really going out that much anyway, right? So let's spend some time together, okay, every day, Monday to Friday, 3 to 4.30. Yep. And like our page, uh, Generations of Virtue, uh, and then the rest of the year's speakers, we will be publishing that as well. Yes, and look out for details, the Zoom details. Join us on 4th of August. It's going to be very exciting. Uh, yeah, follow Salt and Light on Facebook as well as Instagram. So thank you, everybody. And uh, I understand we have probably just uh, four questions, remaining questions to answer. If we can bring back the uh, panelists uh, to help answer some of these questions. Okay. What to do if family is not close? to come together. Mm -hmm. Okay, how do you apply the synergy and... <laughs> mm. 
and Carol maybe also can help out. Benny, maybe you go first. I, I think when, when families are not close, usually that there are you know concerns that may be there, hurts, wounds that may be there that needs to be talked about, needs to be resolved. Um, and and sometimes when I see families who keep a distance from each other, interesting is thing to see is that sometimes they are keeping apart is actually their way of preserving the family. It's almost the idea that if we come too close, we'll end up hurting each other uh, because they, they are not sure how to deal with the pain, how to do, deal with the disappointment. Uh, and, and, and in these situations, I, I would encourage you know, uh, these families to seek help, to seek someone to mediate uh, on their behalf, to come and be like a peacemaker. Uh, and, and I think that that would be what would be helpful for them. Thank you, Benny. Um, Carol, you have any inputs here? No? Uh, yeah, well, I think one of the suggestions I have is uh, start with mm. the small things. I guess even mm. earlier, Carol and Nico did mention mm. the small little things, you know. I think for, for myself, some, sometimes uh, 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 my son, I mean, being a young mm. teen, yeah, young adult, mm. uh, <laughs> not, not mm. teenager already. Mm. Uh, and uh, sometimes young men don't talk a lot. Nah. Mm. So, and, and, but uh, uh, his love language is food, nah, supper. Mm. So mm. there was a period where <laughs> I just mm. uh, do the daddy thing and just buy supper for him, but no need mm. to say anything. You know? mm. So I guess if we understand mm. the love language of each of our family members, that mm. will definitely help, trust me. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Because sometimes uh, the little, little things that we do, uh, mm. If the love language is touch, maybe just a pat mm. on the shoulder. If the love language is words of affirmation, just speak positive words mm. and affirm them when they do something well. Of course, I think food is everybody's love language. Yeah? <laughs> uh, okay, uh, let's do the next question. How do we inculcate the habit of helping mm. families and others who are less, far less privileged? Mm. Yeah. I think earlier we did touch on this. Maybe someone can add something. Mm -hmm. Happy okay, maybe I'll go as a young Good. person. Mm. Yes, please. Yeah. So um, when I was younger, I think like in primary school, so that was about like 10, 11 years old. I think for some of the events that my family went to, it was even younger. And so actually, um, most of the time, it would be like our entire family. Um, in some cases, it would be me, my sister, and my mom, because my dad would be busy with work. And so uh, I just remember following my mom to different events to help the needy in Singapore. And so mm. uh, one of them I remember was Jalan Kuko. And so... Uh, there were some instances where we would pack food and then we would carry all those heavy bags as a like an eleven year old kid and I'd walk up the stairs and I'd give to the uncles and the aunties who for some of them are even um living in a one flat house and so I think it was just those instances of um doing it together with family as well as seeing how different um the home can be for somebody else who may not be as privileged as I am. And mm. so I really think that helped to open my eyes to um, to see that Singapore is not like the picture-perfect Singapore that you think it mm. is. And mm. to really use the resources that we have to help other people. And for mm. me to say that is already like next level, right? Yeah. I know maybe yeah. like some of the teenagers yeah. my age may not have the same thinking, mm. but I really think um, it's those things that we do together as a family and really... Mm. Um, other instances of um, exposing ourselves to the different aspects and social um, groups in Singapore. Mm. Yeah. Thank you, Nicole. Wonderful. Yeah, if I could add to what Nicole has shared, it's mm. not just the doing it together with uh, the children, mm. but it's also the preparation. Like before we go and help, we, we mm. explain what is the intent, what are they going to see. Mm. During the actual giving, so there are certain teachable moments as well. Mm. Even mm. sometimes, for example, when we walk along the corridor and we see red paint at the door, mm. right? Mm. Then we explain to them, oh, why, why do you think it's like that? Because we don't want to assume that children understand what mm. these are. So it becomes teachable moments. 
that mm. and after the the giving or whatever uh, volunteer work that we do the debrief is just as important so mm. this whole process can be turned into a very rich experiential learning for the children and also for for me as i do this uh, i am also learning so much about mm. uh, different segments of society so it's a very enriching family bonding activity that's actually free <laughs> i don't have to mm. travel very far away for family holidays but mm. when we do this as a family it's so meaningful and it, it creates a lot of opportunities to talk and that's what i value mm. wonderful carol thanks I, I i remember i focused on the family we encourage families to serve together and there was mm. one time we did a flag day and then we see parents and children going out together mm. no by the way if you need to do flag day i bring your children along because mm. usually people will give <laughs> 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 and it's a it's fun as, as as well you know before you go to all the mission trip or the mm. village uh, do something that is uh, uh, less scary for your children if they are young I want to move to the next question because I think it's related to also about teaching values. Values are taught, not taught. Mm. Also about serving the needy migrant workers. Mm. Uh, but it seems that uh, one child is receptive, one child is not, and into games. So there are two mm. issues here: online games, mm. <laughs> and the other mm. issue is about teaching compassion. The other one is how do we, yeah, help young people to spend less time online. Yeah. Mm. Any comments here? It, it's 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 always tricky when you have um, more than one child because uh, the 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 I, I guess the difficulty is is how do you acknowledge the difference that the children have, and the difference need not be a bad thing. Uh, uh, and and but sometimes as parents we 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 tend to compare, uh, which is quite unfortunate for kids. Um, so I I suppose a, a reminder is you know that that each child is different. Each child is is special in their own way. So one child may be very much into uh, gaming, and and that's how he or she gets into the world. And another child may have very little interest in it. So acknowledging the, the, the difference, but also at the same time, is what defines you as a family. So whilst you have the difference, you also want to have the commonality of what is our family's tradition, our family's values. And these are things that you could establish even from a very young age. And this is what we do. This is how we have our meals. This is how we share. This is what we talk about, you know. And so that the children learn that there is a family culture that's consistent, even though they may have their own differences, you know, as children. Thanks, Benny. Yeah. Carol, want to say anything? Nicole? I think uh, I just wanted to add on the point mm. of the online games. And mm. I think... Um, like online games as a label, I think can be quite dangerous also. Because I'm sure there are like online games that add value to your life instead of like wasting it away. I guess there's two there's two sides of the coin, right? So mm, like mm. there are the ones that are really productive and um you really learn more about like the world around you. But then mm. um there are those and yeah, I'm not gonna lie, there are those that are really take like one one game is thirty minutes and mm, like people mm. play multiple games. So uh yeah i guess there is both perspectives but i think really um and the question was also about how um the younger daughter is like mm. more receptive to befriending the elderly in the community mm. but then um the son is merely focused on the games mm. so i really think um i feel as a younger person it's not just like go and do it because mommy says so i'm really sorry mm. but like um yeah i really don't think that is like the ultimate goal because um, it might just lead to the son saying, okay, if my mom's going to say this, then I'm just going to do it and make her happy. But I think maybe that is not the point and maybe mm. we want to um, see why he's so focused on his online games in the first place. Um, I mean, if you're talking about gaming, it could be the community that he has online and some of these games also, like my mom and I also talk about games in our other sessions, um, how there are games that you can't really stop in the moment mm. and um, and it's not bad to have that community because there are some communities that are really wholesome and like they do mm. look out for one another and like I, I know there are some instances where um, somebody is not acting like they normally do online mm. and then everybody's mm. like are you okay are you okay mm. so I thought like there is also that positivity 
and mm. do not just see it as like a very bad. It's going to take your life away. Mm. Um, and I think it's also to have that middle ground between um parent and son, um, to really hear what he has to say about his games and maybe. Um, his way of um, giving back to the community and helping those in need is also different. It may not be um, the mm. way you expect it to be, but maybe he could be helping a friend in school. It could be mm. saying hi to the neighbor in the lift. Um, it's those small things, and um, I feel as a youth, I don't want to be limited to like a track. Like there are so mm. many other mm. tracks that okay. I can give back. I can mm. show love to other people and help those in need. Mm. Yeah, okay, yeah. Nicole. Mm. Wonderful. Carol, you want to say something as well? No, I just <clears throat> just to add to Nicole to say that some of this compassionate work, mm. you know, it actually can be done online. Mm. When they are making friends with somebody who is hurting, for example, mm. uh, those things that we, we may not see it from because for as parents we only see them on the phone, uh, mm. doing this all the time, but actually they are doing many other things mm. that we mm. yeah, that might be actually compassionate acts. Yeah. Mm. Thanks, 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 uh, Carol and Nicole. We have come to the final question, and I think the most appropriate person to answer this could be Benny, no, no. a counsellor. <laughs> Here he says, family is important, no doubt. Please let us, tell us how to help kids to manage in a single parent family. This group of families can be quite lost in the Christian community, even in the Christian community, mm. uh, single parent families. And of course, uh, uh, Jason Lee, uh, has actually indicated some resource that uh, mm. we go to, but maybe here, uh, Benny can help answer mm. this question as well. Yeah, I, 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 I like this question because I think it reflects a, a degree of not just compassion, but acknowledgement, you know, the the thing to 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 keep in mind is so when you think about a family, our 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 conceptual frame is that it must be father, mother, and then the children. Uh, but families are are fast changing, and when you have a single parent family, you may have a missing father or a missing mother. But although the biological parent may be missing, there could be others who could play the role, and this is where I think we could tap on the church community to be the extended family. Uh, and, and I hope that whichever church community that you belong to, that they will reciprocate, they will be accepting, they will be warm. Because sadly, sometimes when uh, churches have members who may have ended up with a divorce or, or sometimes, you know, even in, in a state where a family member may be no longer around because of death. Sometimes the church fails to reach out to these individuals you know, to show them the compassion, that, that act of uh, redemption and reconciliation. So I hope the church can be the extended family to look out for that because we do need, if not father, we need a father figure. We do need, uh, we, it is great to have conversations with older brothers, you know. It's nice to have an uh, outing with other sisters. You know? we, we, we do need that. Uh, so going back to that, that idea that it takes a village to raise a child, it takes a family uh, and large Christian extended family to raise families. Thank you, Benny. Actually, um, as many mm. say, in the church setting, there should mm. not be any motherlessness and fatherlessness mm. because there are mm. so many spiritual fathers and mothers, mm. uncles and aunties, youth pastor, mm. etc. Mm. So uh, even in the cell group, right, you have uh, mm. uncles and aunties around. And really, thank you very much. We have come to the end of uh, all the Q&A. We have answered all the questions. Well done, panelists. <laughs> first time we answer all questions. <laughs> Our first time I'm involved in panelists where we managed to answer all the questions. So... Um, thank you very much.